with the Humboldt Community Business Development Center. And today we're going to have a workshop on accounting and bookkeeping. Uh, since legalization, cannabis businesses in Humboldt and beyond have had to adapt quickly and in many ways. Our industry has entered the world of others, a world that needs to be navigated. And a crucial element to successful navigation is the keeping of books and solid accounting. So today we welcome Valeria Cruz Sandino to give a training on this. Valeria is a CPA certified in California and tax professional registered with the IRS, as well as a QuickBooks certified advanced pro advisor. Valeria has worked in public accounting at the top 200 largest CPA firm in the US, serving high net worth taxpayers, multi-state business operations, working, working with international tax matters. Her accounting firm, GAP, her, sorry, her accounting firm is KWB and it specializes in seed to sale bookkeeping and inventory costing, 280E cost accounting and tax services, GAP accrual basis, financial statements preparation, cash flow maximization, and IRS state compliance. And now we'll turn it over to Valeria. Welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Nicole. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And if, Let me know if you can see now. We can see your screen. And folks, if you have questions, you can field your questions to the chat feature and uh, we will ask them midstream. So folks can just uh, hold your questions or keep them in the chat feature. That'd be great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Val and uh, I'm a California registered uh, CPA and I'm also one of the founding members of KWB Accounting, which is a CPA firm specializing in accounting and taxation, specifically for the cannabis industry. In the next few slides, I'm going to be covering uh, the current state of cannabis laws and I'm gonna be providing an overview of the main aspects of accounting, record keeping, and tax compliance that every cannabis business owner needs to be aware of. So I'm gonna give you a little history on marijuana and the laws going back to 1970, which is when marijuana became classified as a Schedule I controlled substance under the Controlled Substances Act. Um, how many people here have heard of code section 280E? I'm sure many people should have by now uh, if you're starting a cannabis company. Um, for those of you that, that don't know uh, what that is, it, um, a lot of cannabis, I mean, all cannabis operators are subject to this law, which states that no deductions or credits are allowed for necessary business expenses uh, for companies that are considered to be trafficking in a controlled substance. So even though in California and in other states, uh, you're operating a state legal business for, for federal purposes, um, the federal government continues to see cannabis as a criminal activity and therefore there's no deductions, no credits whatsoever on their tax return. So to give you a little background on 280E and how it came about, um, so in 1981, a cocaine dealer called Jeffrey Edmondson filed his business tax, uh, tax return for his cocaine operation. And he claimed all his business deductions, uh, his apartment, uh, packaging expenses, and all the expenses that he incurred in running his business. Um, so right, right after this happened, the IRS took him to court right away and they didn't want to allow any of those deductions. And the tax court actually sided with Jeffrey Edmondson because there is a, a, a law that indicates that you're, you're supposed to report all your income, whether it is legal or from illegal sources, you're supposed to report it, to report it no matter what. Um, and at that time, in 1981, the, there were no, no rules, no, no, no 20 e no regulations stating that you couldn't take any deductions. So he was able to take all his deductions on his tax return. And the IRS was outraged and um, 
1982, a year after that happened, the IRS and Congress enacted 280E into law, which um, you know states no credits and deductions are allowed uh, for businesses that, that, that are trafficking in uh, Schedule One or Two controlled substance and ma marijuana as of today it's still considered a Schedule One controlled substance. So now let's talk about the regulations specifically in California. So currently the barriers to entry into the state legal cannabis industry are pretty high considering uh, limited access to banking, you have to navigate a lot of complex state regulations and there is a really high tax burden as well. You have to navigate, you know, several different types of taxes. You have to consider federal and state income taxes, excess taxes, sales taxes, cannabis taxes, local taxes, etc. depending on what, what county you're in. So after full legalization happened in 2018, California took the position at first to conform with federal policies uh, by not allowing deductions on the state tax return either, resulting in high taxes for state legal cannabis businesses. So since the federal government to this date continues to treat cannabis uh, as a criminal activity, and the high taxes are putting a lot of businesses at a, at a disadvantage, California decided to take matters into their own hands to help the industry. So uh, at the end of the last year, uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom passed a bill, uh, bill number 37, which was approved on October 12, 2019. And this was to provide tax equity to the cannabis industry. So uh, uh, under the new bill, um, um, starting January 1, 2020, licensed cannabis operators in California will be able to claim all their business expenses on their state tax return, even though they still won't be able to take those, uh, th those deductions on their federal tax return. So there is actually an exemption uh, to 280E, so it's not all bad news for cannabis operators. So after, cannabis, uh, after Congress passed 280E, the Senate released a report in which they, they clarified that cost of goods sold is not considered a deduction for purposes of 280E. So uh, cannabis operators are still able to take cost of goods sold on their tax return, uh, but they can't take any other deductions. So if they, if they claim rent expense or marketing expenses, those are considered deductions. But if they claim cost of goods sold, uh, which, which is the cost of producing or acquiring their inventory, that's not considered um, um, a limitation under 280E. So here's actually um, a document that's also uh you can download this from the irs website the irs actually for the longest time they did not have any any insight or any information about about how cannabis businesses should prepare the, their taxes or keep their bookkeeping so we, we were going based off of uh, case studies that have been coming out since 2015 but this month the irs actually created a marijuana page for information for cannabis operators. This was updated last week, I believe. So this is fairly new. And they actually um, have a copy of, the, the, of this document that I'm showing you here. So under this, um, under this uh, document that, that was released by the IRS, um, the Senate indicated that all deductions and credits for amounts paid or incurred in the illegal trafficking in drugs listed in the Controlled Substances Act are disallowed, uh, but to preclude possible challenges on constitutional grounds, the adjustment to gross receipts with respect to effective cost of goods sold is not affected by this provision of the bill. 
And th this handout will be provided to everyone uh, after the call. And this, this can also be downloaded on the IRS website. So um, it's good that the IRS is, is providing more guidance on how cannabis businesses should do their accounting and follow um, their taxes. Um, so the only expense item, as I mentioned, that cannabis businesses can legally take to arrive at taxable income, which is the number that you end up getting taxed on, is cost of goods sold. So cost of goods sold is, de is defined as the overall costs that went into producing goods uh, sold by a company. So all the costs of, of direct materials and labor and indirect overhead are pulled into cost of goods sold. So when you're doing your accounting, you need to keep track of what, what costs are direct and indirect and what can be added or not to cost of goods sold. Um, so since cost of goods sold is the only expense item that you can take on your tax return, cannabis businesses end up paying taxes on gross profit instead of net income. So a regular business would be able to take uh, their sales minus their cost of goods sold um, and to arrive at their gross profit. And then after that, they would be able to take all their necessary business expenses and then they would get taxed on net income. But for cannabis companies, they get taxed on the gross profit. So here's an illustration to show you how that works um, and what I mean by paying taxes on gross profit versus net income. So cannabis businesses end up paying taxes on a much higher amount since a lot of business expenses that the IRS wouldn't consider necessary for production get left out. So on the left side, we have a regular business. And like I mentioned, you take your total sales minus cost of goods sold, and then you arrive at your gross profit. And then, you, and then a regular business can take all their necessary business expenses, legal expenses, um, uh, general and admin exp expenses, marketing, interest expense, and then they pay taxes on their net income. So that would be their taxable income. But for a cannabis company, the way it works on the tax return is they take total sales minus cost of goods sold, and then the IRS will tax you on that gross profit. So the cost of goods sold is the only item that, that should show as deductible on the tax return. And then everything else is not allowed, unfortunately, because of 280E. So now that you're aware that cost of goods sold is the only expense item that you can legally take, you're probably now wondering what you can include in cost of goods sold and how you can maximize it. Well, first, before you do that, you need to choose which accounting method you will use to keep your books and records. So normally when you first file your first tax return for your company, you start a company and you file your first year tax return, on that first tax return, you're supposed to let the IRS know um, what method of accounting you'll be using to keep your books and records, either the, uh, either the cash and pool or another method. And then after that, if you want to if you, if you want to subsequently change that accounting method, you have to ask for permission by filing a change of accounting method form. And then the IRS has to approve you after that. So it's best to, to know how you're going to keep your books and records right from the start. That way you don't file cash accidentally in the first year and then the following year, uh, you realize that with the cash method, you cannot take, um, you, you, you cannot add as many things to cost of goods sold since you're not doing the accrual method and doing inventory costing and adding, adding cost to your inventory. So you have to make sure that uh, you choose the correct accounting method right from the start. 
So um, under the accrual method of accounting on the left side, um, you can use inventory costing. So what this means is that every month you're adding as many production expenses as possible to your inventory on hand. So all the costs get expensed as custom goods sold once the final product is sold. Um, so you spend you know, uh, six months growing your uh, cannabis plants and during that time, a lot of um, expenses go into producing that. So you need to account for those expenses correctly on the books. That way, once you sell that product, you're able to take all those costs that you incurred for producing as cost of goods sold. So the other method that you can choose um, on the left side is the cash method. So the way 280E is written, it severely penalizes taxpayers using this method as there's no inventory costing used and therefore you would be forced to report your expenses as deductions from your total sales. So since 280E indicates that, that no deductions are allowed, cash method producers and farmers will have significantly higher taxable income as they wouldn't be able to recoup their expenses through cost of goods sold. And in this handout that, that we'll provide, it, which is also downloadable um, on, this web, on the IRS website, the IRS indicates that cash meth, um, I think I have it highlighted here. Here. Um, So um, in this document that the IRS provided, it says apply literally 280E severely penalizes taxpayers that traffic in schedule one or two controlled substances, but don't use an inventory method for the controlled substances. When required to use an inventory method, a taxpayer is also required to use an accrual method for purchases and sales of merchandise. And then here it says a cash method producer of a schedule one or two controlled substance such as marijuana typically will, will deduct all production costs in the taxable year paid and thus will not have any adjusted basis in the product that it produces. When 280E is applied in the case of a producer and a producer can be a grower, can be a manufacturer uh, in a schedule one or two controlled substance and all deductions from gross income are disallowed, the producer's taxable income for each taxable year will be significantly higher than that it would have been if the producer had, had used a permissible inventory method and recouped its production costs through cost of goods sold. So this is all information that was provided by the IRS and in all the cases that have come out between the IRS and, um, and marijuana companies, the IRS has won almost every single time based on 280E and they quote 471 in every case um, that you're supposed to be following that method to, to calculate your cost of goods sold. So here is the timeline of how the accrual method works. Um, so this timeline represents the financial life or of a seed or a clone from day one on the financial statements. So on day one, it gets recorded and as, as you're growing the, the plant uh, from seed to sale, um, all the expenses uh, are accrued to each plant based on the yield and the percentage of completion each month. Um, so every month um, you would have to um, account for your inventory. Let's say you have 100 plants in immature, you have uh, 500 plants uh, in working process. So all those plants in working process, we calculate um, what the percentage of completion is and what costs should be allocated to all those products in your inventory, whether it's working process or finished goods. So as you can see here, by the time a product gets to finished goods, there has been a, uh, there has been a, lot, a, a large amount of time 
uh, coupled with significant costs that must be allocated to these products. If you don't allocate the cost properly, then what you end up with is, for example, um, if you buy a clone, it might be, you know, a very low value. It might be five bucks. So if that's what you show on the books as, as, as what it costs you to acquire your inventory, then on, your, on the tax return and on the books, that's the only expense that you have to show as cost of goods sold. Um, so if you're not accruing a portion of rent, a portion of utilities, salaries, payroll taxes, insurance to the cost of producing your plant, and if you don't have a monthly method for doing this, then you'll be paying a um, significant amount of taxes compared to um, what you would pay if you're um, adding more, mo if you're following um, the correct method and allocating the proper costs to your inventory, then you'll be able to still be able to deduct uh, most of your costs. Um, so that's a good thing about producers, um, such as cultivators and manufacturers, even though 280E applies, if they use the accrual method, um, they'll still be able to take most of their deductions um, on their tax return. So what is the proper way of determining cost of goods sold? So according to the IRS and all the cases that have come out between marijuana companies uh, and the IRS, um, it, it indicates that cost of goods sold uh, for a cannabis company is determined by following regulations under IRC uh, 471. And this, you can actually find this information um, in, in the IRS website. Uh, they talk about 280E and 471 here. It says the Internal Revenue Service takes a position that Section 280E affected taxpayers must calculate their cost of goods sold pursuant to Internal Revenue Code Section 471. So uh, 471 dash three, uh, code section 471 has uh, different subsections. So for uh, 471 dash three refers to uh, how dispensaries and resellers need to account for, uh, for their cost of goods sold. And 471 dash 11 pertains to how, how cultivators, manufacturers and processors should, should allocate their cost of goods sold and calculate that. So um, here's a copy of IRC uh, 471.11. For those of you who want to go through this, um, it's divided into different pools. Um, the cost that you can allocate 100%, other costs, you can only allocate a portion, like rent and utilities. Uh, you, cannot, you, you can only take a portion of that, de depending on what portion of, of the facility is actually being used uh, for cannabis. If there's a portion of the facility that's used for anything else, uh, such as admin, uh, that's not considered a cultivation space. Um, only um, anything, o only the, the spaces that are, that are um, uh, for cannabis production would be allowable. And then there's other expenses that you can definitely not add, which we'll get into that later. So um, 47111 includes items like direct material, so inventory, grow supplies, fertilizers, uh, soil, uh, things like that can be added to the cost of growing your inventory. Uh, also direct labor, such as all the staff that work on the farm, for example, trimmers, 100% of their salaries uh, can be allocated to cost of goods sold, uh, payroll taxes, benefits for those employees that can be added to cost of goods sold as well. Um, and then there's other items, uh, like I mentioned, like indirect overhead, so you can allocate a portion of rent, utilities, repairs and maintenance. And we normally see in farms this number is pretty high. It's usually 80 to 90% of the farm space can be used, um, of those costs uh, can be added to inventory. 
And then the other 10 to 20% is usually uh, not deductible and, and it's considered general. And, uh, on, and under 471-11, general and admin expenses are not included in cost of goods sold. So there's things that you cannot add to cost of goods sold um, according to uh, code section 471. These include uh, things like marketing, advertising, um, interest expense, and general and admin expenses. So code uh, 471-11 for producers, uh, cultivators, manufacturers um, goes further into explaining that there are certain costs that cannot be added to cost of goods sold unless these costs are accrued to inventory consistently, either monthly or quarterly. So um, right here, let me find that, that part. Okay, so this is another um, part that, that says that there are some costs that you can include to cost of goods sold, but you have to be using uh, generally accepted accounting principles. And under this method, you need to be preparing your books and records at least on a quarterly basis. So if you're not doing these accruals into inventory at least on a quarterly basis, then you're not following GAAP and you won't be able to add items like uh, property taxes, depreciation, um, spoilage, um, a portion of officer salaries. Um, so those are expenses that unless you're doing this on a consistent basis and you're showing that every quarter we're doing all the allocations to inventory, then you're not following gap and then this, this list of expenses cannot be added to cost of goods sold. So how can cannabis businesses save money on taxes and avoid audits? Well, cannabis businesses are highly scrutinized by the IRS and have a much higher chance of being audited. Um, there was actually a study that came out recently, uh, a few months ago by an agency that audits the IRS and they took a sample of 237 tax returns and 59% of, of, of those returns had Tweety adjustments, meaning that they took deductions that they weren't supposed to, uh, they weren't aware of this, and um, now that, 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 that resulted in about $48 million of back taxes paid back to the IRS. Um, so, and the IRS is a few years behind on audits, so, if you file your tax return this year, it may not be until five years from now when they come and, and audit that tax return and they wanna see all this, all, all this substantiating documents and how you came up with cost of goods sold. So it's, 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 it's good to have a system to keep track of, of how you came up with everything. Um, so if you have a method each month or each quarter and everything's documented, then there shouldn't be a problem. So there has been uh, actually a lot of cases that have come out. The latest one was the Harborside case. Um, and the IRS ha has won almost every single time. Uh, the, the, there was only one case where the IRS won, um, but that case was a very particular case. It was a caregiving uh, company um, and they had, um, extremely good books and records, and that's why they were able to win um, against the IRS. Um, so they had everything separate, you know, what, what was cannabis and what was not cannabis, and they ended up uh, winning, but what, uh, it, it, it all came down to having extremely good books and records, and the IRS couldn't fight it. So um, not giving enough attention to, you know, tax preparation, uh, documentation can result in high interest, penalties, and fees. 
so some areas where you, where you can reduce tax liability, secure deductions, and at the same time avoid or get through an audit successfully are, are the following. Using square footage to allocate indirect, in, in, indirect expenses like rent, utilities, repairs and maintenance. So for example, you would only be able to take a portion of these expenses related to, to the production space such as the rooms used for growing and storing. So for example, if you have a farm and you have a total of 10,000 square feet in real estate and you, you measure all the area and you come up with 8,000 is used specifically for cannabis, for greenhouses, for storage, and then the other 20% is used for an office space or, or a residence that we have on site, then that part will be excluded. So um, the I, uh, for 71-11 re requires you to have um, this sort of detail uh, in order to allocate the proper amount to inventory. So another thing that you need to keep track of is employee classifications um, and then time allocations uh, for, for payroll expenses. So for example, the salary of a grower is fully deductible uh, all the payroll expenses, insurance that, that you pay on that person, since it directly relates to growing and production. Whereas, for example, the salary of a butt tender in a dispensary is not deductible because according to section uh, um, 471, no selling expenses, no marketing expenses are, are allowed. So they consider the butt tenders um, a selling expenses they're selling it. So um, those salaries will not be taken into consideration. So it's also important that all deductions, allocations, and processes are well documented in order to be able to substantiate the numbers in case of an audit. So in order to be able to substantiate business expenses and safeguard your business as much as possible in case of an audit, proper record keeping, documentation, and internal controls are vital. So proper accounting practices are not optional in this industry and are a requirement to maintain licensing and remain compliant. So document and keep a paper trail of every cash transaction. Um, most cannabis businesses operate in cash and sometimes lack adequate internal controls over cash. So create and document internal processes such as daily cash counts and monthly inventory counts. Um, it's also important to keep strong controls over your inventory by performing reconciliations every month between your green documentation and inventory counts, seat to sales softwares and accounting systems. So if a cannabis business is operating without good records and written documentation, the IRS can come and deny all deductions uh, for business expenses. So um, once your reports and accounting are rock solid, you and your management team can use th this data to strategize, to manage your cash flow. Um, and there are a lot of uh, systems and softwares out there, such as Xero uh, and HubDoc, that can help you keep track of these um, and make sure that everything is documented um, and that in case the IRS comes, everything's in place and you have nothing to worry about. And also another thing to keep in mind is that metric actually requires you to reconcile your inventory uh, every 30 days. So um, every 30 days, it's, it's a good practice to allocate all the costs for that period to your inventory, all the direct and indirect costs, um, and also make sure that you're doing counts on the last day of the month. Count all the plants on, uh, on the farm, what's in process, what's been harvested, what's immature. And then, and then those counts every month have to tie out um, with metric exactly. And, and, and it has to be documented because it's required by metric to maintain licensing for, for California and license holders. It's on their website. And uh, if you're not doing this, 
Um, and if it's not documented in accounting, there's a saying that if it's, if it's not documented, it doesn't exist. So if you did the counts and you're reconciling metric, but it's not documented somewhere that you did that, then it doesn't count. So it's important to have everything in paper um, and have the right systems to be able to keep track of, of everything. And now I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Valeria. Anybody, if you have questions to ask or to put in the chat, either way. I have a question. Um, if um, you're, you're talking about how, it, you know, the, the need for documentation is essential um, and um, an IRS audit might not occur to like five years after, let's say this yeah. year. Um, so let's say this year um, I'm just learning all this and I'm just pulling it all together. Is there a way to still file and pay taxes according to um, what my farm business did and then kind of pull the quarterly pieces together in a more um, traditional way? Or do I have, you know, like, or, does that make sense? Like, can I, can I get my act together after the fact? Cause I know I have to file my taxes in less than a month right now. I, I filed yeah. myself this year. Yeah, you definitely can. It's best to, um, to get this ordered out right at the beginning. But if you have been going for a while, then you can still do a cleanup. Uh, you, you can go back um, a year or more and you can still clean up the books um, and make sure that you find somebody that can help you uh, clean up the books and then make sure everything is allocated uh, to inventory, everything's allocated to direct and make sure that you're following 471-11 and um, and, but you can still uh, do clean up. You can still go back and clean up the books. Uh, and it's important that you do that before you file. That way you don't have to go back and, and amend it later on. Yeah, like, yeah, have it together initially, but then, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah it's <laughs> trying to keep up, but there's just so much to keep up with that these things are, you know, falling by the wayside and I have to kind of come needing to know what my time frame is, is to come back around, revisit it, and get it together properly, you know? Yeah, it's definitely possible, though. Um, you don't have to worry too much if you haven't been doing it right, because you, you can go back and, and fix it. Um, it may be a little more costly, though, to go back and, and try and fix everything from a whole year. So it's best to just, from the time that you start, try and have all this information, but if you don't, then you can always go back and, uh, and, and, and clean up the books. And um, you mentioned a couple of softwares that helped with like monthly. What were the names of those again? So the one we use is Zero for accounting. So I'm, a, I'm actually a QuickBooks uh, Pro advisor, but QuickBooks announced uh, that they're not uh, accepting cannabis businesses. It's uh, against their, their, their policy. They actually uh, conform to the federal government and uh, it's actually in their privacy policy. Uh, I was reading through it and they have a list of companies that of, of types of businesses that cannot use their platform as in, included is marijuana and CBD companies. So it's, um, some people are using QuickBooks, but it's risky. Valeria, could you give again the name of some of the software that, that uh, yeah. works well for cannabis businesses? Yeah, so it's uh, Zero. Uh, Zero is one of them. So Zero we use for uh, the accounting for to, to, to be able to create your financial statements, profit and loss, balance sheet. And then Zero actually comes with another software that they acquired called HubDog. So I'm going to uh, hub doc. So that document basically ensures that your books are audit proof. So when, um, you know, I tell, I tell people to, to download the app, um, the, the hub doc app. And once you sign up for zero, it comes for free. 
uh, with zero and zero, I think the, the lowest uh, plan is $9 and the highest plan is $60. And it comes with HubDog and with HubDog, it's a, it's a document management software. So it basically every transaction in your p and in your balance sheet yeah, has, a, has a document attached from HubDog. So if the IRS comes five years from now, you don't have to worry. All, all you have to do is uh, go to zero and show them the, the financials. And then every, we, we, we always stress that every transaction, especially the ones that are going into cost of goods sold, need to have the receipt attached because for the IRS, uh, one thing to consider is that they don't accept, like if you only have the bank statement and you tell them, here's the expenses, it's on the bank statement, that's not good enough. They don't accept the, the, the bank information. They want the actual receipt or bill or invoice or source document. So HubDoc is that. It's a document management software and you can download the app or log in into your account and upload documents. Or if, if you're on the go and you buy, you know, soil for your, for your business, you can just snap a picture and it will automatically be uploaded into HubDoc. And then, and then every transaction in, in, in zero will have the receipt attached. So if you click into any transaction, it should have an attachment of what receipt that was. And, and that makes your books audit proof. So if the IRS comes, usually one of the big problems is that they, they don't have complete books and records. That's what they require. So books and the, but the balance sheet, the profit and loss, and the records are all the receipts. So you're supposed to keep all the receipts. And we usually recommend that if it's, you know, if it's anything, I, I, ideally you want to have a receipt for everything. But ideally, if it's something high dollar, like above five hundred dollars, have the receipt attached to zero. Valeria, we have a question from a manufacturer. How do we record? How do we record chargebacks, reductions to our pay due to promotions or sales from our distributor? This is from a manufacturer. Okay, what what was that again for the? Uh, so the question, or uh, Robert, if you're here, Robert, Gail, do you want to ask it? I don't hear from, from Robert. So um, he's, he's writing, how do we record chargebacks from our distributor? And chargebacks would be reductions to our pay due to promotions or sales. Well, uh, if it's anything related to uh, promotion or sales, you know that's strictly uh, not deductible, or you 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 basically can't account for that for for purposes of 471. And uh, it's actually uh, there's actually a section here for for costs that cannot be included in cost of goods sold, and those are you know marketing, advertising, selling expenses. So you, you would account for that still, like that would still show as an expenditure on your p &L, but it just wouldn't be part of cost of goods sold. Did that answer the question? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, but manufacturers, uh, processors and cultivators, they all need to be following 471-11 and if you're a distributor or if you're a reseller, then you need to be following 471-3. I had another quick question. You talk about um, percentage of facility being used. Um, what about if you have, say, 40 acres in a 10,000 square foot um, license and grow? Does that mean that uh, they count the entire 40 acres? Mm, that, yeah. that, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so it's actually only the real estate portion that would be, so for example, uh, you know, some people have, you know, a uh, five acre farm, but it's, it's actually only the real estate. So for example, let, let's say you have 10,000 square feet of space in total. So 
you have to go and measure all the real estate, all the storage facilities, every structure that's on the farm. It's not the, the entire farm, but just the actual structures. So you take all the structures and if it's 10,000 square feet in total, but you, you determine that only 80 or 90% of those facilities are actually used for production of cannabis. So greenhouse space, storage space, uh, any space that's necessary for the production of cannabis. And if you have an, another facility in there, sometimes we get that there's a residence and they have people living in it. So that's considered uh, general and admin. And here, uh, general and admin expenses um, for the company as a whole is not included. So it's only if it's specific to cannabis, any specific space. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, rent and 80% of your facility uh, you determined uh, is used for cannabis, then you can deduct, uh, you can add 80% of rent to cost of goods sold and the other 20% stays in, in the profit and loss as, as, um, as a non-deductible. So 20% uh, stays in your, in your profit and loss and the other 80% uh, goes to your inventory costs on your balance sheet. And then you, you're supposed to have that documented on a document how you came up with that calculation, uh, because if, if they come and, and audit you, you wanna be able to show how you came up with that percentage and um, actually go out and measure it and be as, uh, as detailed as possible. I'd like to ask if you could clarify something on that point. Um, so Ruth asked, if you've got 40 acres, you're using 10,000 of it for your, your growing and you have structures. Yeah. You've got the, um, you determine 80% of those structures are being utilized for your, your growing. But your property tax covers 40 acres, so how do I figure out what percentage I'm actually taking of my property tax then? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So property taxes would actually uh, be included as well. Uh, let me see if I have an example uh, to show you. So property taxes, um, that's, um, that's part of the, the 471 uh, expenses. So here, if you're doing GAP properly, then you can deduct um, a portion of your uh, property taxes. Um, and we usually do it too based on the percentage. So if 80% of the facilities are used for, for cultivation purposes, then 80% of the property taxes are allocated to cost of the sold. And then the other 20% of the property taxes are you know, just an expense on the profit and loss and they won't be deductible. Okay, thanks. So even if only a small portion of my 40 acres actually has facilities, I still can do the 80% of property taxes if 80% yes. of my facility, if I understood. Okay, thanks. Yes, exactly. Cool. Valeria, to this point, when you're talking about real estate, um, or structures, how is that defined by the IRS? Is it structures that have a foundation or how is that defined? Yeah, so um, anything that's a permanent structure, um, you know, like a greenhouse or a storage facility or a barn facility, um, anything like that or a house. Uh, so any, any structure, you know, that, that's uh, attached to the property that has a foundation, you know, anything like that. Okay, is a, do you know if a foundation specifically is required or what, uh, how does the IRS draw the line there? Uh, not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's pretty great. The, the, the tax system is pretty great and we usually do it on a case by case basis. So they, there's, there's a lot of rules on how to depreciate uh, how to depreciate uh, the structures, but um, you know anything that's uh, that's reasonable um, 
normally what we get is uh, greenhouses, um, uh, barns, a uh, house on the property. So structures like that that are, that are considered real estate. Sure, thank you. And uh, I mean, say if there was like, a, you know, if someone had, had a poured in place fence around it, would that, would that qualify? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so for that, uh, for that purpose, uh, so you wouldn't be able to take um, like the fence deduction, for example, but if you, but if the cultivation owns the property, then they'll be able to take depreciation. So um, it, I think under a gap, it's 39 years for, uh, for real estate, for commercial real estate. Um, so for a fence, you know, for anything that's a uh, part of the, the structure. So if you get uh, electric work and you spend ten thousand dollars, then that's that, then that's considered part of the cost of the property, and uh, it will be the same thing uh, if you have the real estate and if it's owned by the company, then you have depreciation expense, and it will be a portion of depreciation. So. 80% um, of the depreciation it goes to Kongs, uh, cost of goods sold, and then 20% of the de of the depreciation gets um, uh, stays in the in the profit and loss. Mm -hmm. I have another question, which is, um, would you talk more, please, about cost of goods sold and um, what qualifies? You know, because I've been going over um, everything that I've spent money on, and I. Each time I, I wonder, you know, are um, uh, the, the, um, the propane we use to heat our hoops, it's like a utility, is, is that a cost of good save, a cost yeah, of good the sold? Propane, or, the um, fuel costs, yeah, definitely. Um, or m materials like, um, let's say, I can't process on site anymore, but let's say scissors for, for workers, you know, like tools, yeah. like, is that, that's another cost of good sold or? Yeah, so I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna share a document that I, that we use to keep track of all the, we have all the, um, <laughs> so let me hear. Oh, so this is a list of expenses that we've compiled, you know, according to 471. So 471, if you go, um, we're gonna provide this, but they, um, they ask you to uh, include, you know, direct costs, uh, direct and indirect costs, indirect production costs. So we've read through this. And um, so for the di for direct costs and direct labor, so these are the things that if you want like a list of expenses that a, a producer can yeah. take, uh, this is a list. So any of the direct labor costs for your trimmers, payroll taxes, um, for the trimmers, for example, and then uh, um, depreciation on any of the equipment that you use for for the grow. Um, so like you mentioned, the inventory grow supplies, all that is 100% deductible if you are accruing it to your inventory. So all the, the scissors and uh, supplies and fuel costs, a lot of people have generators that they use. Um, so if, if it's used for the grow facility, then yes, that's 100% deductible. So these are all the costs uh, that you can take 100% of. And then when it comes to these types of costs, uh, indirect costs, like depreciation of the building, or if you added a fence to the building and mm -hmm. it's uh, a permanent structure, then that's considered part of the building. So you would depreciate that over 39 years under a gap, under a gap accrual method, and then you can allocate in this case it's it's 89% of the of the depreciation for the, for the building and the repairs and maintenance are allocated and then you would have something like this to show oops sorry about that you have a, a portion of um, you know you would have to show how you allocated the, those costs your uh, property taxes to your rent your utilities and depreciation. Um, so this is a chart of how you can document that and how you can document the, the space used. And then you would do the same for employees. So if you have employees and let's say you, you have a manager 
and they're spending 60% 60, 60 of their time on the cultivation and 40%, you know, paying bills, doing admin stuff, then that 40% would not be includable, but the 60% of his salary would be allocated to, to your cost of goods sold. Thank you, Valeria. And there is obviously so much more that we'd like to continue to talk about. Now, Valeria, you will be giving part two of a workshop on accounting uh, for cannabis businesses in three weeks on October 14 during Industry Affairs Call. Uh, we are completely up on time, but could you just very briefly say what you will talk about during that workshop? Yeah, we're just going to go, um, I was actually going to be presenting more on this information, um, go through our process, uh, what we recommend, um, how you should keep your books on a monthly basis. So ju just give you more of an insight on on cost of goods sold and, and, and talk more about taxes and some new things that have come out that we can cover today. Yeah, thank you very much, Valeria. There are more questions too about uh, possible compassion, charitable donations, uh, obviously these uh, documents that you've just opened up. So we look forward to discussing this um, uh, on October 14. In the meantime, if some of you want to contact Valeria directly, she's uh, uh, reachable by email. Valeria at kwbaccounting.com. We're right up at 10 o'clock. So thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time.